two weeks ago, had a wonderful family vacation. Uh, this past Sunday was helping out a church in Colorado. But as always, always my greatest gift to return home to the Park Plaza family. God is doing so much in this church right now. I mean, you go through the parking lot. Uh, there's a Stephenville van out in the parking lot, uh, living in our youth room for the week, uh, getting ready to work with contact. This past weekend, uh, there were hundreds of young people here, college-age students from dri driving up from Miami, St. Louis, flying in from California, being a part of Campus, Mi Campus Ministry United. I don't know if the Stephenville group is in this assembly. Are you here? this morning. There they are in the back. We're glad to have you here this morning. So glad to have you. This past week was a great week for me. On Tuesday, uh, our men's softball league is up and going again, an outreach event to bring folks in. I love going to those games. I love the name of our softball team. You'd be proud. You go and you look at all of the teams and they read like this, Rejoice Christian. Uh, Friendship Baptist, Park Plaza, the 11th Plague. And uh, those guys go out there and they let them have it. And I enjoyed going last year, this year on Tuesday, my first Tuesday. I, I thought I'd show up and do more than just cheer them on with my vast array of athletic prowess. I thought I'd go out and be a part of what was going on. And I got to tell you, after one look at my fielding and base running agility, the team met with me and said, Mitch, it'd be unfair if you played. And I said, I understand. It wasn't on the way home until I understood they weren't concerned about the other team. They were more concerned about me. And so as I look at the way things are going uh, as far as age and things like that, in fact, it was just about three days ago that Shannon was, she was fussing over a prescription, a new prescription bottle she'd got, and she said, I can't even read this thing. Would you come and take a look at this and tell me what you think? And I go over and I look at the prescription bottle and I'm trying to bring it into focus. And I go, well, no one could read this. The print is way too small. It's all blurred out. She said, honey, that's not the problem. It's in Spanish is why I can't read it. <laughs> I thought it was because. And so a new thing happened. And guys, I need you to pray for me. These have come into play. And right now you are a blob. <laughs> but when I do this, ah, it is in Spanish. Okay, and so... Anyway, as things continue in the aging process, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I'm trying to work out more. I, I know I've shared this with you before. One, my, my greatest addiction, Diet Coke. I, I've decided I've got to give this up completely now because you know why it's bad for you. The short-term memory, they say it just wrecks it. The caffeine intake makes you jumpy. There's other stuff in there I don't need. And it really... Did I, it wrecks your short-term memory. It's horrible. And so uh, these are things, I think I've told that joke before, but anyway, short-term memory. Uh, I'm convicted that there are some things in my life that have got to change. I've come to this conviction, and so it was about a month and a half ago that I decided to do something that I now really understand is the 11th plague. It's a workout routine known as CrossFit. I did this for not one week, but two weeks, but three weeks. And I want you to know that any exercise routine that contains the word burpees should be avoided at all costs. I, I'm back to not working out again. I'm back to drinking Diet Coke like it was water. And it's not exactly good. The bottom line is this. I don't have enough at this moment personal conviction to see my conviction through. Whatever your convictions are today... Brothers and sisters, you need to understand it's what your future is going to be tomorrow. It is impossible to build a future. Now, you can have a future. It'll just happen by default. But it's impossible to build the future God would have you have without convictions. It's impossible to build a family. You can have a family by default. It'll just happen. But it's impossible to build a family like these families that God wants us to have without convictions. It's impossible to build a church. You, you can have a church by default. In fact, I wonder if we could even call that a church if it's not based upon the convictions here. It's impossible to grow in Christ. It's impossible to continue in Christ. It's really impossible to pass on Christ without convictions. This morning, 
you find yourself, many of us find ourselves at a moment, individually, a big change. You've got sickness in your family. You've got trouble in your family. Maybe your big change revolves around a job, the loss or the gaining of a job. Maybe you're not going to take the advancement, or maybe you want to take the advancement. You find yourself at the moment of a big change individually. Today, this church, and in this season, this body of believers, we find ourselves in a moment of big change. And our convictions are what are going to see us through. It's not so much about being people who are all knowing of what the contents of the future holds. It's more about the convictions that we have today as that future unfolds before us. And brothers and sisters, you got to know one thing this morning. I, I, about two days ago, came pretty close to chunking the lesson and speaking from the heart. But I'm convicted that these past few months, this story we've been in, God's story, I'd rather talk to you about someone else's heart today than just my heart. I want to talk to you about God's heart. I don't believe we've been in this story just haphazardly. But I believe of all things that the lesson today that we're at in God's Word is especially for this body. I'm convicted. I have the conviction that God is speaking and leading this family. Amen? I also believe it's not something that just started a couple months ago. In fact, as I go back to a year ago, you know where we were a year ago, church, this month? A year ago, church, this month, we all sat down and on that screen played a video, in my opinion, one of the best videos ever made, made by Brute Wolf, and we watched for about 19 minutes the 50 years of this church. We sat there and we watched men and women leave comfort zones and not just continue to partner with a church in a new site, but leave 15th and Delaware, leave 10th and Rockford, leave 29th and Yale, leave churches like Eastside where they were comfortable and go to a new place and do a new thing. And you know what we did as we watched that video? We were inspired and we applauded. We not only applauded, we stood and we gave a standing ovation because of men and women of faith. And today, here we are at another one of those big moments. I wonder if five years from now, if 50 years from now, our children and our grandchildren and people that we will not even know will look at what we're doing today and say, man, their convictions. I'm inspired by God, but i got to be honest that I'm inspired by how God moves through His people. We come today, and, I, and please don't let this lesson be just about what God is doing here collectively with this body. This lesson is bigger than that. This lesson transcends that. This lesson is about your individual faith. This lesson is about that step you're about to take, and you don't know what has brought you here. You don't know about that next step, and you are nervous. You are frightened. You are upset. Lord, what has happened here? And there is not just a conviction I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the, not a, the core conviction. That once that conviction is in place, come what may, everything is all right because the Lord is where he should be and that is enthroned in our lives. And so this morning, I'd like to tell you a story. This story plays out a little bit like this. It involves some disciples that are not much different, if any different, than these disciples that are here today. These disciples in this story, they're far from perfect. These disciples, I wonder at certain times if they felt like they had signed on for way more than they thought was involved. These disciples were men and women that were just, they were as fragile as could be. But like those disciples and like these disciples today, they were following a perfect Lord. And they were growing in a conviction. And of all things, the story I want to tell you about today, let me tell it to you in paraphrase form. Jesus, the perfect author of faith, leads 12 to Caesarea. Leads them way up north by Mount Hermon. 
And as he gets him up there, you need to know one thing about the story and the teaching that Jesus is about to do. It is about location, location, location. Caesarea Philippi had had a history, centuries, if not a millennium, of religious dedication to idols. They had been about Baal worship. If you go to Israel today, you'll see road signs that say to Banias, B-A-N-I-S. That B in the Jewish language is a P. Today, they still understand that after Baal worship, it was a place of Panias, Pan. They worship the goat god. It moved from Baal worship to Panias, Pan worship, until finally at the time where Jesus arrives there, it is secularism, materialism. If you wanted to buy into atheism, any type of pantheism, all gods, everything, it was as pluralistic and idolatry as could be, and there were temples to every god there. It was a buffet of designer faith. And as Jesus leads these disciples there, as the Word of God leads these disciples back to Caesarea today, Jesus doesn't so much have a teaching. Oh, it's a teaching, all right, but it comes in the form of a question. And Jesus looks at the twelve and he says, Who do people say I am? And man, it's chatty. Those twelve, you can't say fast enough who people say he is. And in the midst of that, one says, uh, uh, Jeremiah. Another says, yes, yeah, some others say John the Baptist. And then it just puts in short form, the prophets. And they begin to fire out those prophets' names. They couldn't talk fast enough. They couldn't have enough answers. This is who people say that you are. And Jesus, after a moment, looks at them again. And now he drills down. And now we're to the point of being convicted. Remember location, location, location. He can barely have this conversation for the thousands flooding in to find their God and worship. And in the midst of this chaos, Jesus looks at the twelve and he says, that's who people say, but who do you say that the Son of Man, who do you say that I am? I've always pictured this story with Peter going, boom, chest out. I say, and man, he lays it on the line. The story may have gone that way. But I wonder if it could have gone like this. The disciples being chatty moments ago, now as Jesus looks at them in light of where they are, if it doesn't get strangely quiet, they begin to kind of look at each other. They've been asking for the entire gospel. Who is this? The wind and the waves obey him. Who is this? But now it's time. It's no longer a rhetorical question. Jesus wants to know, who do you say he is? And I wonder if it wasn't silent. I wonder if Thomas didn't make eye contact with him. I wonder if John nudged James. Go ahead, go ahead. I wonder if Andrew started to, but... Oh, he, he knew there would probably be one. I wonder if Matthew started counting stuff. <laughs> you, ever, you ever been class teachers in that moment where you ask a question and your class goes strangely quiet and you want to speak up, but you, and Jesus doesn't ease the tension. He waits. And then I wonder if not in bravado voice, Peter instead says, but he says it, you are the Christ. The Son of the living God. That is the core conviction of Christianity. You can be fuzzy on a lot of stuff in your life and call yourself a Christian. You can wonder about this or that. But the core conviction that you cannot be fuzzy on is who is this one who stands before you who asks, who do you think he is? This morning, really our first point and our only point is this. The conviction of the story, the power of the story, the only thing that matters in all the universe is this, is that the conviction of the story comes from a confession. 
It doesn't come from a battle. It doesn't come from a miracle. It doesn't come from a heavenly display, yet all of those things and context were involved. The truth and the veracity of the story comes not from a Ph.D., not from a thesis, not from the greatest theologian on the planet. In fact, Jesus would say to those who had been searching the Scriptures, you missed it completely. The greatest conviction of the story and where the story finds its power is when a backwoods, hillbilly, fishy-smelling fisherman looks at a busted knuckle carpenter who's skinny and about the age of his young 30s and says, I see standing before me the Christ. The son, and boy, note the word, I love it, in the middle of all the dead idols, the son of the living God. It's that conviction that drives who we are and what we are in Him. And brothers and sisters, i got to let you know today that it is not politically correct today, nor was it then. Especially not then, and I think we are in Caesarea Philippi in our age that we live in today. Where it is designer faith, and you can find anything you want or any way you want to get to where you want to go. But it is not politically correct In fact, there were people at Caesarea Philippi who were sincerely praising their God. And this statement by Peter, this confession by Peter says this, you can be sincere in your worship and sincerely wrong. He is the way. We have a world today that would have us know it's okay to follow Jesus as a decent fellow. It's Go ahead and bring that up. It's okay to think that Jesus is a decent fellow. In fact, after all, he helped the poor. He helped the downtrodden. Jesus trademarked the golden rule. He told parables about not just being a good neighbor, but be a great neighbor. Muslims believe he was a prophet. Atheists believe he was a moralist. Buddhists would call Jesus a great teacher, though I think it interesting that the one time someone called Jesus good teacher, Jesus said, don't call me that. It's okay to think in our world that he's a decent fellow. The problem is is that Jesus didn't call himself just a decent fellow. He kept referring to himself as the Son of God. He kept using statements like, I am, referring back to the burning bush when Yahweh showed up, when God showed up and said, I am. Jesus, this carpenter, is calling himself God. The word Son of Man is a reference to Daniel 7 and 13. You say, Son of Man, that's a humble terminology. It's anything but that. Daniel 7 and 13 says, When the Son of Man appears, oh, you'll know it. The clouds will be the dust of His feet. Eighty times that term is used in the New Testament. Seventy-nine times Jesus is using it, speaking of Himself. He's not just a decent fellow. Some would say, well, He's a demented fool. He's crazy. He's lost. He's, he's let His cheese slip off His cracker, if you will. But think about it. People loved him. Men loved him. Women loved him. Leaders loved him. Lepers loved him. Prostitutes, pagans, and publicans came out of the woodwork to follow him. Lunatics produce as their followers lunatics. Jesus produced wise men and women who changed the world forever. Well, he's not just a decent fellow. He's not a demented fool. Some would say he's a deceiving fraud. The problem is, is that this book says twice, God from heaven says, this is my son. And I find it just as appropriate to look at the other witness, not just those who are holy, but those who are ultimately unholy. The devil in Matthew 4 and 7 said, if you are, and that if could be turned in our language today to, since you are the son of God. The devil knew it. His minions, the demons, were constantly saying, He's the Son of God. We know who you are. Notice this about demonic testimony. Jesus never once accepted it. He always declined it, but he never denied it. What is still debatable among men on this earth, that very same matter is settled in hell. They know who Jesus is. Heaven knows who Jesus is. He is not a deceiving fraud. He's not a demented fool. 
He's not just a decent fellow, though he was more decent than anyone who ever lived. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. And here's what they say. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was, and still is, the son of the living God, or else he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, nor did he intend to. Now that was C.S. Lewis from some time back. I'd like to show you a clip here of a little bit modern day C.S. Lewis. In our world of pop culture and rock superstardom, Perhaps no other group is more in des designer faith and finding your way than this group. But at the pinnacle of achievement in the music and entertainment industry is one band known as U2. You may not know who they are, but take it from me, they've sold a few records. Do you sell records anymore? Whatever they sell, they sell them, okay? Their lead singer, they haven't been big, come and go for a week, one hit. They haven't been big for a year, a, a decade. They've been big for four decades and sh so no, show no sign of decline. Their lead singer, Bono, is interviewed by a reporter who's less than friendly to the Christian faith. And I'd just like to show you part of this, of this gentleman who is not of designer faith and what he has to say in C.S. Lewis' form about who Jesus is. What or who was Jesus as far as you're concerned? I think it's, the, it's a defining question for a Christian is who was Christ. And, and I don't think you're let off easily by saying a great thinker or a great philosopher or, a, a, you know, because actually he went around saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He was crucified because he said he was the Son of God. So he either, in my view, was the Son of God, or he was not. No, no, nuts. Nuts, yes. Forget yes. rock and roll messianic complexes. This is like, I mean, Charlie Manson-type delirium. And I find it hard to accept that all the millions and millions of lives, half the earth for 2,000 years, have been touched have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nutter. I just, I don't believe it. I, I so therefore it follows that you believe he was divine. Yes. And therefore it follows that you believe that he rose physically from the dead. Yes, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I have no problem with miracles. <laughs> I'm living around them. I am one. So, so when you pray then, you pray to Jesus. Yes. The risen Jesus. Yes. And you believe that he made promises which will come true. Yes. I do. Something in this book about if you acknowledge me in front of men, I'll acknowledge you before the Father. Wasn't a decent fellow. Wasn't a demented fool. Wasn't a deceiving fraud. This book says exactly who he was. He's a divine friend. Matthew 16 and 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Number two, the conviction of our lives comes from this very confession. It's not only the power of the story. This same confession is the power of our lives. 
We say it so many times and we take it so for granted that it ceases to lose its oomph, its power to completely transform us. Larry King, the great interviewer, was asked once by Bryant Gumbel, the one person that you have not interviewed, that you could interview, who would it be? Larry King, without thinking twice, said, well, it'd be God. Bryant Gumbel laughs a little bit. Larry King goes for the home run. I'd interview God. Bryant Gumbel then follows with this question. What would you ask him, Mr. King? Larry King, without hesitation, one question. I would ask God, did you really have a son? Because if you did, it would make all the difference in the world. Boy, Larry King got it right. But it is not just about asking the question, it is about answering the question. If the conviction of our lives is the same conviction of the story that has transformed the world, it changes everything. It changes our relationships. It changes our marriages. It changes how we parent. It changes how we work. It changes our finances. The essence of faith is acting, not just believing, acting as if God knows what is best for our lives and only He has the power to accomplish it. It leads us in this conviction of confession to get to two other questions that Jesus answers for us in the rest of the story. Number one, what does He think of me? See, we come to point sometimes where we believe He is God. We believe He's the living God. But the real question is, now does he be, how does he begin to define me, and what does he think of me? I'm glad you asked, because next week in the story, we're going to get to how much Jesus thinks of you. We're going to get to just how much Jesus loves you. But it comes to another question of what does Jesus want for me? Not from me, but for me. Matthew 16 and 17, read with me now. Right after the Peter's confession, Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what does God think of you? We're going to get to that next week. This also involves what God wants for you. He wants you to die to things of this world. He wants you to be resurrected to the plans and purposes that He has for you. He wants you to die to your own power and have His power, His very life in you. But there's one other thing in the lesson this morning that he wants for you, and we just talked about it. Peter, you're the first one to ever have the conviction that I am who I am. And Peter, I'm giving you on that confession and to all those who will follow you, I'm giving you privilege, the keys of the kingdom. I'm giving you power, keys to the kingdom. And that privilege and that power leads to passage for others. What you let loose into me will be let loose into me. What you don't let loose into me will not be let loose into me. And Peter, you have a powerful, privileged job of giving me passage. And for anyone who has ever stood, whether it be knee deep or chest deep or neck deep in water, and you have said those same words that Peter said as someone asked you, who do you say he is? And with conviction you said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God. And I am ready to give my life for him. You've been given privilege and power and passage. And this morning I have a challenge for you. Begin to use the keys or give them back. No more middle ground. No more talking about having keys and not letting people into the kingdom. Let us be people who use the keys or give them back. The other day, I headed out to my Jeep, and uh, in our office parking lot, boy, you talk about conviction. This was on my windshield wiper. 
Nice Jeep. Little, what's this thing called, honey? A QR code. Doohickey thing helps me find stuff on the web, all right? And so I go to that QR code, and it tells me to join Jeepers Anonymous, a family group that promotes good things. That really didn't convict me. That was Tuesday in this church parking lot. What convicted me yesterday was in my driveway as I was done cleaning my Jeep and began to make my way into the house. Sir! Sir! Young man about 20 is now making his way into my garage. That's kind of, you don't know somebody, they're coming on in. Kind of, yeah, can I help you? Pulls out a card and broken arrow in my driveway. Jeepers Anonymous, we'd love for you to be a part. And man, I got convicted real fast. There's apparently some people that think enough about Jeeps that they want to tell you and use keys to invite you into their club. And for me, the Spirit spoke to my heart and said, when was the last time I chased somebody into their garage? And there's nothing anonymous about it, but I want to tell you about the only name that you need to know, and his name is Jesus Christ. Use the keys or give them back. Well, Mitch, I'm in a tough time. How am I going to make it through this? This church is in transition. How are we going to make it through this? The essence of faith is to act as if God knows what is best for us. And we believe he is the only one that can bring that about. Amen, church? Maybe today in your life you've had the keys for a long time. And maybe today's the day you don't want to give them back. Today is the day you want to dust them off. Today is the day you want to begin starting with your family. You want to walk in your garage, and before you step in anyone else's garage, you want to go through your garage into the living room, and you call a family meeting, and you say, Come here, kids. I've had some keys, but I haven't been using them. I've been given power, privilege, and now, children, I want to give you passage. And maybe some of us have taken that step, and now we begin to go into the office. He is the Son of the living God. And he is the one that calls you home into his plans and his power and his passage today. Are you convicted? Be convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we can pray for you in any way, if you want to come be a part of this body of believers, we come join this group of disciples following a perfect one. Or if you want to stand about waist or neck deep or knee deep in water today and say, I believe he is the Son, the Christ. Come now as we stand and as we sing.